Welcome. My name is Donna Antanasio, and I lead the Energy Law Program here at GW Law School. It is my pleasure to welcome our next panel, which will be addressing the topic of garnering public support. The panel will be moderated by Peter Wolf. Peter is an attorney, and he is also the founder and president of Nuclear Energy Solutions, Inc. Nuclear Energy Solutions is a consulting firm and also co-founder and partner in NuclearEnergyTV.com, which is an internet TV channel presenting a broad spectrum of programming related to nuclear energy. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Peter and to the panel. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is the panel on Paul Garner and Public Support. And uh, we are here with uh, three wonderful speakers. The conference title, Investable Nuclear Energy, is pretty straightforward and has a plain meaning. And it would seem that that would be the same with garnering public support. But the question really arises, what do we mean by public? Do we mean the general public? Do we mean uh, a specific segment of the public, uh, such as uh, energy groups or environmental groups? Do we mean those who influence public policy? Do we mean the actual potential investors uh, who are involved in the uh, public-private partnerships that uh, are being sought? And what are the goals that are trying to be achieved? Why is public support important? How would the public help achieve the goals we're trying to reach? And how do we reach that segment of the public that we're interested in reaching? We need to know how they get their information. We need to know what would motivate them to act. One of the items I would like to discuss before we get into uh, the, the actual subject matter is, I think that there's always this elephant in the room, which is why does nuclear energy have a perception problem, particularly in the United States? The US was in a golden age for about a quarter century between roughly the end of 53 to 1979. And then of course, Three, uh, Three Mile Island happened and there has not been a single plant in the US, a nuclear plant that has been conceived and completed construction in more than 50 years. We can look to negative TV ranging from The Simpsons to specials about uh, TMI, which is now going on now, uh, or Chernobyl a couple of years ago. And we can look at uh, what I term the three bugaboos of nuclear energy, which are waste, safety, and cost. But it, it's really a perception issue because all these items are manageable. And I would suggest as we talk to the public that uh, we, we entertain discussion about these terms and we try to find out what their concerns are and discuss it. So we would need to have facts on hand so that we would be able to respond to whatever segment of the public that we're actually discussing this with. The other problem about perception that I see is that I think that nuclear does not uh, put itself in a more public and positive light. Why doesn't the nuclear industry proudly tout the fact that over the last 50 years, we have saved an enormous amount of greenhouse gases? Uh, James Hansen, who is uh, a leader in the environmental movement, once said that, that 1.8 million lives have been saved because nuclear energy prevented more fossil fuels from being emitted over a half a century. And from what I've read, two thirds of the people in this country actually support nuclear energy, yet they don't know that two thirds of the people actually support nuclear energy. So I think we need to change perception. And, and there are many ways to change perception. One way is uh, what uh, Steve Nesbitt was talking about in his presentation yesterday, who Steve Nesbitt was uh, president of ANS, who has a program in schools called Navigating Nuclear. But I think we could also talk to all the people that we find who are interested and receptive to hearing about nuclear energy. So what do we offer to the quote unquote public? Certainly to the general public, I think they have three primary concerns. The first is that they want a reliable, steady flow of electrons when they turn the switch on. The second thing is, I think they want to be able to deal with climate change. And the third is that they would want energy security. 
Historically, and still, nuclear is the largest single supplier of fossil free energy in the US. And many countries are now embracing nuclear. It has a great deal of advantages. It can mod modulate renewables. If, if new energy needs to be uh, furnished, it has a much smaller footprint than most other sources. There are small modular reactors that have versatile applications in military, remote locations, such as mines and emergency situations. There is a, a really a, a strong case to be made that over the life cycle of a nuclear reactor, uh, it compares very favorably economically because normally you would need several generations of renewables that need replacement over the life of a nuclear reactor. And advanced reactors can be a great partner to other forms of energy. One of them would be hydrogen production, which requires a very high level of heat. But there are a myriad of other uses today, ranging from micro uses such as medical to macro uses in space uh, travel. And there are many potential uses, such as desalinization, and even the possibility of being able to power enough to get the greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So to talk about these uh, positive attributes of nuclear, we are really blessed with a wonderful panel today. And I'm not going to go into the uh, bios because they're in your materials, but uh, we're going to have three speakers. The first will be Greg Lamar from the Nuclear Energy Agency, which is part of the OECD. Next, we'll have John Wenzel, who is Vice President of Communications for NEI, which is the Nuclear Energy Institute, which is probably the leading voice for the nuclear industry. And then we will hear from Ashley Finn at Idaho National Labs, uh, who is in a, a very unique position in terms of the development of the new nuclear and she may talk about her past experiences uh, with NIA because I think Judy Greenwell was the past speaker. So let's get on with it. Uh, Greg Lamar, you're up. Thank you very much, Peter. Pleasure to be here. Maybe if uh, uh, the friends at the other end can just uh, put up the presentation. Uh, I am the head of the Division of Radiological Protection and Human Aspects of Nuclear Safety at the Nuclear Energy Agency in Paris. Very happy to be here. I'll try to provide in the next uh, eight to 10 minutes, which I've committed to stay within the bounds of a bit of an overview of, of what we're doing on the international front. Next slide, please. So very quickly, for those of you that aren't aware, we're, um, as Peter said, a member of the OECD, the Nuclear Energy Agency, 34 member countries, plus a number of strategic partners. We work across a variety of areas namely safety science, uh, waste management, um, radiological protection, public health, uh, nuclear law as well. And I know you've heard from Kimberly Nick, one of the other heads here recently, a uh, fairly small organization, but I'd say that we have uh, a fair bit of, uh, of cloud internationally by bringing together expertise from all of these member countries and our working groups and expert groups and the like. Next slide, please. So I'll dive right into it because I think what we're talking about here when we talk about how to engage stakeholders and who are the stakeholders and you know how to build that relationship is, is one of trust. And we've done a lot of work at the NEA uh, over the last number of years. I'll get into that in, uh, first of all, you know, quantifying what is a stakeholder and very importantly, what is trust? And, uh, and you can see on the slide there that you know, and, and I'll get into this with some of our projects that nuclear issues really are embedded in those broader societal questions. Uh, and Peter mentioned them environment, risk management, energy, health, cost, economics, all those types of things. And, and in order for us to really move forward collectively, we have to really do, I would uh, uh, opine, a better job at involving stakeholders throughout the entire relationship of nuclear projects going forward, much more so than we have in the past. We've done a lot of work with our international members in, uh, in moving this forward through a number of workshops and engagements that I'll get into in, uh, in the next slides. Next slide, please. So a couple of things uh, that we did, we had a number of stakeholder involvement workshops that started back in 2017. Our member countries were very vocal about the need for us to, uh, to start to deal with these issues head on 
So what we did was uh, hosted a number of stakeholder involvement workshops, looking at first in 2017, the nuclear involvement and in, uh, decision making. We went from there to 2019 in looking at this uh, risk communication, because we know that in order to um, involve, engage stakeholders, that, uh, that that concept of what constitutes uh, effective risk communication is a key one. Uh, we are moving forward this year and next in another stakeholder involvement workshop, or third, on optimization and decision making. What we're going to try to do is look at it across all sectors, nuclear and non-nuclear, to look at if uh, we can arrive at a framework for an effective stakeholder engagement uh, con construct and decision making that could be applied throughout any life cycle of a nuclear project going forward. So that's an ambitious program with webinars and some workshops this year and next. Next slide, please. So we've had a number of standing working groups uh, operating within the construct of the NEA for a number of years. Uh, the Forum on Stakeholder Confidence has been around for over 20 years. That was really uh, designed and developed to look at the back end of the fuel cycle, waste management, decommissioning, and how to build that relationship. When, when, uh, when this group uses the word confidence, I, they continue to reiterate to me that, you know, that really underpins uh, trust with those, with those uh, stakeholders as well. And you can see some of the tasks on going, I'll point to one, that's youth involvement. And I think it's really key that when we're looking at nuclear projects, that we realize that, um, that there are very many segments within the stakeholder community, youth being a very key one, given the fact that we are invariably talking about multi-generational projects. And I'll talk a little bit further in uh, some upcoming slides that the youth want to be in, engaged, involved in a very different way, perhaps, than other segments of, of society. On the right hand is our working group on public communication. They've been doing a lot of work on stakeholder involvement, communication as it relates to the relationship between nuclear regulators and the public. On to the next slide, we've got uh, some of our stakeholder trust and engagement work and some recent publications. I won't go into all of those, but those are all available on our NEA website. And I, I invite you to, uh, to consult that after the talk. Next slide, please. So a little bit of a deeper dive on uh, a recent public survey that I think gets to the heart of our topic on, on trust. Uh, back in 2020, we launched a project uh, via the Working Group on Public Communication that was looking at the characteristics of a trusted regulator. Uh, a lot of respondents across 35 countries, so that was the NEA countries plus uh, the UAE that looked at what are some of those key elements. And I would... Uh, uh, put forth that although these may be specific in some cases to a nuclear regulator, I think they apply more broadly in many cases. So we will be over the coming months putting out a, a green booklet on that work. But then that, that group also wants to look at how to build and maintain uh, some momentum on that, coming up with some practical guidance that could be applied as well. So I'll go into a little bit more detail in terms of what that uh, uh, that uh, survey said on the next slide, please. So yeah, so what did it say? So three attributes sort of uh, were preeminent, I think, in those almost 800 survey respondents. And I, and I should say that came from the public, but probably largely those that were a little bit more cognizant of the nuclear industry, those members of the public that were interveners, non-governmental organizations. So it does have a certain slant to it, but, but by and large, they were looking for independence, knowledge and competence and impartiality and objectivity from the regulators. And you can see, you know, obviously this is across uh, all, the, all the countries that responded. So we can't draw any national lessons. But I, I think it probably would be very applicable to the, uh, the American audience as well. Next slide, please. Interesting to compare those results across other, uh, with other uh, institutions and in that as well. We can see academia, how they relate in terms of public trust with the nuclear safety regulators. Academia, fairly strong. News media, not surprisingly, perhaps not as strong. You can see the nuclear industry. I thought that was kind of surprising that nuclear industry and the regulator have a relatively similar 
level of, uh, of trust with, uh, with the public respondents there. Well, what, what does this tell us? Well, it's interesting. I think there's always things that can be learned from other uh, institutions. Um, you know, if I was looking at this uh, from a, a regulatory perspective, I'd say, you know, that'd be really interesting to learn uh, the level of trust garnered uh, from academia and how we would be able to leverage that in our trust building relationships as well. Teaming up with academia, looking at uh, joint undertakings and projects and the like. So work's ongoing there, but I think that's uh, really interesting stuff. Next slide, please. And then a bit of a spider chart with some of the same information. Yeah, you know, this was quite interesting as well. I think people were expecting perhaps the elements of empathy in that relationship. The, you know, how much time and effort do you put into that relationship? Much less important when uh, the public was looking at what they expect out of the regulators. I would expect that the same would be of, of utilities and that. Uh, really, they want... Uh, maybe not so much independence from the utilities, they want knowledge competence, they want information, they want transparency, they want to have a dialogue, they want to have a relationship, but you know, there are some interesting uh, factors that obviously did not come out quite as strong. So that's what we've been doing. I want to now pivot to where we're, where we're going on the next couple slides, please. So we went to uh, the NEA's governing body is, is our steering committee. It's through them that we have our program of work budget and the like. So the steering committee through uh, the review of our NEA strategic plan, 2023 to 2028, um, put emphasis on the fact that they believe that we had to do more work in the areas of stakeholder engagement, trust building and, and the like. And it's in that effort that we've come up with a concept called the high level group on stakeholder engagement, trust building in the social sciences. You know, a bit of the context there, um, you know, in the early days, and I think Peter made mention of the, you know, the 50s and 60s age, it was, we would say a little bit more of a deferential relationship between governmental authorities, uh, utilities and that, uh, as to what constitute, constituted the overall interest of society. I think we all would agree that that's really changed and that there's much higher public expectation Things like transparency, citizen involvement, collective collaborative decision making and that as we move forward to try to meet societal needs through COP and other in this clean energy transition. And there really was a feeling among uh, senior officials at the Nuclear Energy Agency that we really needed to step up and fill a gap there. So we put forth um, this concept for a high level policy group that will uh, engage through the social sciences, academia, think tanks, in trying to come up with some policy recommendations along that spirit. Next slide, please. So a little bit more here on, on where we're going, and this has got a, a three-year mandate. This will be providing advice and recommendations, policy advice directly to the steering committee. Steering committee is made up of senior officials, uh, usually from the, uh, the foreign departments for all the NEA member countries. They'll be advancing concepts and policies that should help members facilitate that dialogue between civil society and the nuclear industry, fostering exchanges, bringing in uh, academic uh, thinking from the social sciences and that to, uh, in essence, try to uh, reformulate that uh, relationship between the nuclear sector and civil society. And as, as it says at the bottom, continuing to support the ongoing work of those other groups at the NEA that are, that are doing very, very good work as well. So that's where hopefully that's, uh, hopefully I've kept within my time. That's a bit of a, uh, a short walk through what we've done and where we're going on these key issues of stakeholder engagement and trust building at the NEA. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Greg. And uh, we're now going to go on. What are we going to do with the questions? Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion afterwards, and we're also going to have questions from the audience afterwards. But I'd like to get the three presentations on first. So, John, if you would proceed, that would be great. John Wenzel, Vice President of Communications at the Nuclear Energy Institute. Thank you, John. Thank you, Peter, uh, and my thanks to Donna for inviting me to be a part of the conversation with uh, with Ashley and Greg. Uh, it's it's really a pleasure to be with you today. 
Uh, I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about this, this subject. It's an important one. Um, and uh, Peter, you alluded to this in, in, in your opening. I actually think that pub, um, concerns about perception of nuclear energy are, are widely overstated. Uh, the, the reality is it's never been a more exciting time to be a part of the nuclear industry. Uh, the Nuclear Energy Institute is the uh, largest trade advocacy organization for the commercial uh, nuclear uh, energy uh, generation in the United States. Uh, we have 300 plus members, uh, everything from utilities to the supply chain uh, to academia uh, and, and um, the, the national labs and, and other aspects of, of the industry. But I, I, I think that uh, we're experiencing an enormous surge of interest in nuclear energy uh, across the board. Um, we're seeing commitments from new customers. We're seeing opportunities both in the US and, and, and globally as, as Greg was talking about. Um, and when you look at the energy policy and the climate policies that are being proposed and discussed both in the US and, and, and globally, nuclear is, is, is now at the center uh, of those conversations. And so from, from where we, we're sitting and the, and the work that we're doing around communication and, and perception, we look at what's, all the pieces are and how they're coming together, right? So right now we're seeing tremendous federal support uh, for nuclear energy, both for the existing uh, nuclear fleet in the U.S. as well as for, for the next generation of, of nuclear um, technologies. Um, the, the, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act uh, that was passed last year uh, and signed into law included um, $6 billion in funding for at-risk reactors um, in operation today. Uh, we continue to see an enormous amount of, of, of uh, interest and support and, and funding for moving the new reactor designs from uh, uh, design to demonstration and, and, and eventual deployment. We're seeing, in, um, particularly over the past 12 to 18 months, an enormous amount of support at the state level. Um, we've had um, states like Illinois, New Jersey, Connecticut, et cetera, um, uh, pass laws to help protect the existing fleet um, and make sure that that carbon-free generation was available uh, to help them meet their climate uh, targets. But now we're seeing an enormous number of states that are preparing themselves for the next uh, generation of, of new reactor technology. So we've had uh, nuclear moratoriums have been lifted in West Virginia, Indiana, other states. We have study bills um, uh, that are looking at advanced nuclear in states like, like Montana. Um, and so you see a lot, a lot of interest at the state level as they look forward to not only meeting their climate goals, but uh, in the view of greater energy security, um, are really looking at, at, at advanced nuclear as part of their long-term energy mix. Um, we're also seeing uh, an, an increase in private sector investment uh, in, in new technologies. Um, it's, a, it's a place that um, we need to do more work uh, and more education um, of the financial community. Uh, and likewise, we're seeing an enormous amount of support from NGOs. Uh, certainly the, the climate uh, non-governmental organizations um, have been supportive and we're seeing more and more support uh, from the environmental NGOs as well as we look at the problem in front of us, which, which is the change in climate, right? And making sure that we have the tools available to us to continue to make progress at reducing uh, emissions. So when we look at kind of what's happening from a perception perspective, from where we set, um, we're seeing an enormous amount of support, not just for the existing fleet, but particularly for the next generation of, of reactors that are, that are under development. As, as an example, in, in the state of Wyoming last year, we actually had four communities compete to host TerraPower's new natrium reactor that's in development um, that will be um, operated by, the, by Pacific Core. So we're now seeing communities and states compete um, for, for this technology. Now, not to say that there aren't challenges, uh, uh, as Peter alluded to um, in the opening, um, but I actually would start with uh, a bigger challenge that we have, particularly in the United States, which is people don't know where electricity comes from. 
uh, they don't really care where electricity comes from as long as when you flip the switch, the electrons are there and the lights go on. Um, and it's something that we take um, for granted. Now, there are some regions of the country with uh, rolling brownouts and those types of things that, um, uh, or after a severe storm when that electricity is lost, that where your electricity comes from suddenly matters. But for the most part, we don't think about um, uh, where the power is coming from as long as it works. And so it's very hard to have a conversation um, with a public that, that isn't that knowledgeable or, or doesn't really care uh, uh, about the topic. Add to that the complexity of how our electric grid system works, right? Deregulated versus regulated markets, um, regional grids versus state grids, uh, uh, you know, peak time, base load, like all of these terms are very, very hard to, to digest. Um, and so it becomes difficult to have um, a conversation about the, the power and the, and the technology itself. The industry also hasn't done itself a lot of favors. Um, historically, um, we've put our heads down and ran our plants safely and efficiently. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we did. We generated carbon-free energy, but we didn't really tell, talk about it. Um, uh, and so most of the information around nuclear energy specifically, uh, as Peter alluded to, you see on The Simpsons, right? And you know, this is where people um, are getting their education. Um, and when we did talk about nuclear, and I, I keep on saying did, I've been in the industry for six years, um, almost, actually five years. Uh, I did, do not have a nuclear background. I do not have an energy background. Um, I knew nothing about nuclear energy before I started working at NDI. Uh, uh, so I'm as guilty uh, as the rest of the public um, of not educating myself. Um, and often what the industry would do was, was answer questions, right? If people wanted to talk about nuclear, they'd sit back and, and answer the questions they were given. Um, they weren't out there proactively really talking about the value um, of the technology and, and the generation. And so uh, other people were defining that conversation. What we've also learned is that um, through a lot of research is the greatest support from nuclear energy, for nuclear energy, comes from the people who know the most about nuclear energy. So. When we do research around our plant communities, the plants in which uh, the communities in which our, our plants operate, support for nuclear energy is is extraordinarily high, 80 percent, 85 percent support in those communities. They know a lot about nuclear energy. It's a part of their community. It's a part of their lives. Many of the people work there, um, or or know have family members or know someone who does. And so the um, that that idea, that concept of the more you know, the the more supportive you are. We've now played out in a couple of um, uh, public opinion uh, surveys over the past three years, right? And, and again, that's backed up. The more people learn, the more supportive they, that they, they are uh, of, of nuclear energy. But again, I come back to this idea that the, that the perception problem, um, I, I do think is, is overstated. Um, uh, the, the feature of this, this um, conference is investable um, technology, right? And um, so just, I think it was uh, earlier this week or late last week, Citi um, uh, published a survey of 10,000 Europeans. So this is not the US market, um, but in Europe. Um, and 20, they found that 25% of, uh, of that 10,000 person survey changed their opinion. Um, from being uh, either uh, uninterested in nuclear or, or anti-nuclear um, to supporting um, new nuclear uh, as part of an energy solution. And it's as they learn more about the attributes uh, about our, the climate, uh, the carbon-free generation, right? The, the ability for, for nuclear to play a role alongside wind, solar, uh, and other carbon-free sources to create that carbon-free future not just for electricity generation, but for other applications like process heat, hydrogen, et cetera, that the support for nuclear really grows. So that's a lot of what we do at NEI, right? Um, we don't necessarily want to make everyone an expert in fission um, because most people don't want to be an expert in fission. Um, uh, but we do, we are talking about nuclear as a solution to these bigger problems that we face. Um, the 
changing climate is an existential threat that's facing the entire planet. Um, when we talk about our role in helping combat that um, challenge, that crisis, alongside other, other carbon-free sources, that's where we start to see people take another look at nuclear or, 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 be, or be supportive of nuclear. And so a lot of what we do is talk about that. Currently, energy security um, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine has become a very, very important topic. Um, and so how we can position ourselves, how we can um, demonstrate to governments around the world how nuclear can help them achieve energy security uh, are, are conversations that are, that are happening now. At a local level, it's jobs and economic impact, right? Um, uh, and, the, and the value we can bring to those communities. Uh, so we, we're seeing a, a lot of support generated. Um, uh, it's, it is a very exciting time to be a part of the nuclear industry. Uh, and uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to be a part of the panel discussion. Uh, and Peter, uh, assuming I haven't gone terribly over time, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, and now we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Ashley Finan. Great, thank you, Peter. I'm gonna share some slides. So if you'll just give me a moment here, um, I'll put them up. Um, it's great to be here. I'm Ashley Finan. I'm the director of the National Reactor Innovation Center and a um, division director here at Idaho National Laboratory. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what NREC is for uh, a couple minutes and then how we approach stakeholder engagement and um, garnering public support for nuclear. And so do you, NREC is a, a Department of Energy Office of Nuclear Energy Program. It's a national program that was launched in FY20. Um, it is headquartered here at Idaho National Laboratory where I'm located, but we work with uh, labs across the country and, and stakeholders across the country, um, as well as closely with the GAIN program, which is the gateway for accelerated innovation in nuclear uh, run by Christine King. And that's, a, that's another DOENE program focused on helping innovators access the labs and move from concept to commercial product. Um, so we're really working to ensure that this deep um, bench of expertise and facilities and capabilities at the national labs is put to the best use to partner with the private sector to move these demonstrations to reality. Part of our vision is to achieve to assist with the demonstration of at least two advanced reactors by the end of 2025 in order to reestablish US nuclear energy leadership with these advanced designs and to support commercial advanced nuclear by 2030 to be able to contribute to abundant clean energy globally. We're also working to prepare the Department of Energy for ongoing innovation in nuclear. Um, one of the things that I think we've seen is uh, an early period of rapid innovation and demonstration, and then a period of about a half century where we had more incremental improvements. Um, but now we're back into this rapid innovation and, and um, really disruptive innovation um, period of time where advanced reactors are seeking to really address the feedback that we've received over the past half century um, to meet the needs of society and to, to address concerns and to try to move forward in a way that, that will meet the needs of the grid of the future and the energy needs of the future. So Enric is working to achieve our vision through our mission to inspire stakeholders and the public, to empower innovators to test and demonstrate their technologies by enabling access to the national laboratories, um, and to deliver successful outcomes through efficient coordination of partners and resources, really working with all the stakeholders um, to, to row in the same direction and help make these projects a reality. And I see these as, as being interrelated because as we empower the private sector, we'll be able to deliver those successful outcomes in partnership with government. And that's important to being able to inspire the public because while there are skeptics, um, as, as John just described, there are a lot of folks who aren't necessarily negative on nuclear, but they wanna see the proof that it's going to happen. You know, they're, they're hopeful that advanced nuclear and nuclear in general might help contribute to addressing our environmental and energy challenges, um, but they need to see the product. They need to see that these demonstrations are successful and that we have something that's going to work. So that's what's going to, to make the big difference at the end of the day is showing people the technology works and showing them what it can do for them in terms of clean, reliable, affordable electricity and um, other, other energy sources like hydrogen, like thermal heat, things like that. 
So our program, I won't go into all of this in detail. This is to lay out the NRIC program on one slide. Um, we started with a gap assessment to identify needs to achieve successful demonstration. And we've built a program out of addressing those gaps. And that includes demonstration test beds where innovators can come to demonstrate their first of a kind technology. It includes um, plugging some key gaps in experimental facilities. It includes modeling and simulation, work with the regulator, both the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Department of Energy, um, and then some, some hard work on the National Environmental Policy Act and how we can start NEPA earlier um, and make sure that we put enough time and effort into it, but do it in a way that we can, we can begin earlier. Um, and that's been something we've been working with innovators as well as the DOE on. Um, we have some key tools for innovators that help them access the national laboratories. And then we have some projects in addressing costs and markets because we want to be sure that as we develop and demonstrate these nuclear technologies, we also bring in the, um, the types of cost saving technologies and market applications that will make them relevant and scalable in the future. Um, and, and while that doesn't necessarily address um, you know, safety and waste, those, those are being addressed as well. Um, cost and markets are, are critical to garnering public support. That's one of the major concerns. Um, we're also working to, to be proactive in impact management. So I mentioned we're working hard on NEPA um, approaches and, and we're also looking at um, we, where we have sites that we're considering for demonstrations and experiments. We're doing cultural and biological resource assessments. We've completed those um, early on to, to check for any sensitivities that we need to avoid or mitigate. Um, and then we have advanced reactors that have different fuel forms. So we're doing the, the research work and the logistical work to understand how we can package and store and, and move and manage um, any of the byproducts of those advanced reactor demonstrations. And engagement and communication is a focus for us. Um, this is a picture of a test bed. I won't go into detail because of our time, but what we're, what we're doing here is taking a dome that already exists at Idaho National Laboratory that used to host a um, sodium fast reactor, and it's now empty. We're refurbishing that so that we'll be able to host um, private sector innovator demonstrations of micro reactors in this facility um, by the end of 2025. These are some of those experimental facilities that I mentioned that we've been um, getting, getting together to support innovators to fill those gaps. Um, and so that's, that's a brief overview of the NRIC program. Now I'm gonna say a little bit about how we think about stakeholders. And, and one thing that we start with is that we think about stakeholders in a more expansive way than some of the conventional approaches. In the past, a lot of the external stakeholder considerations have focused on the federal regulator, the state regulator, and the DOE. We think it's really important that we expand that to include all of the key groups that have an interest and an influence on these types of projects. So that includes um, local elected officials, environmental groups, businesses, community organizations, um, and, and folks in the community. So that's where we start with, um, where, that's where NRIC, NRIC starts in our engagement. We also want to be modernizing stakeholder engagement strategies for advanced nuclear. And this is important uh, both because we, because nuclear has a, a special need for stakeholder engagement because of what has really been a broken social contract over the past many decades. Um, and we've heard about that earlier in this panel, so I, I won't belabor it, but I'll just um, postulate it at this point. And, and note that we need to fix that, that, that advanced reactors are, are not somehow immune from that baggage, um, but also that we're looking at new deployment models where advanced reactors um, will be smaller, they'll be more versatile, and they're gonna be deployed in applications that are new, uh, not only central power generation stations run by nuclear utilities that exist today, um, but, but applications where they're gonna be implemented by utilities that don't have existing nuclear or implemented in industrial applications. And so where today the stakeholder engagement function is owned by the nuclear utility and managed by the nuclear utility, as we move forward, we need a stakeholder engagement function that travels with the nuclear power plant and could be used effectively by any owner operator um, or by any community and, and user of this um, advanced technology. So we think that we need to do technological innovations, sure, but also 
um, these important innovations in how we interact with society. And so we're studying some of the industries that do today and have in the past used a much more participatory approach to community engagement and stakeholder engagement. And um, we're working particularly with the University of Michigan to um, evaluate those successes and learn from them and develop some best practices. In terms of our engagement right now, um, we also have some key tools on uh, social media and the web. Um, I mentioned the University of Michigan work with their Fastest Path to Zero organization. And then we have an effort where um, we're hoping to have some university grants for social science efforts in um, advanced nuclear siting efforts where um, we really would like to see more of a um, quantitative focus on environmental justice. And we lack some of the, the key metrics to allow us to evaluate environmental justice impacts of nuclear power plants. So um, that's an area where more social science research is needed. And through the Nuclear Energy University programs um, uh, program, we have, um, we have had a call out for grants in, to award grants in this area and had some really promising proposals. So I'm looking forward to seeing that work done over the next few years. Um, finally, we've developed a siting tool for advanced nuclear development. This is really for innovators to be able to compare sites um, around the country. And it looks at technical and safety aspects of sites, as well as economic aspects um, and legal aspects of sites relative to um, moratoria and relative to nuclear sentiment in a given area. Um, so that's something that innovators can use to get a better understanding of how um, a site might might look compared to another one, both in terms of economics and safety and um, nuclear sentiment. So those are the, the that's the conclusion of my slides. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying that that Enric sees this um, area as being very important. And we think that while we may not be able to convince everyone to support nuclear, um, there's a lot we can do to improve on the practices of the past and to engage with stakeholders who were historically neglected, but have a lot to offer this conversation to help us improve as we move forward. Thanks very much for, for um, the ability to participate in the panel and I'll, I'll hand it back to you, Peter. Well, thank you very much. Um, those were three great uh, presentations. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're a little short on time. So I, rather than starting the whole panel discussion, I'm gonna ask each of you a question that, that has arisen, at least in my mind, and hopefully that will be beneficial for the audience. Uh, starting with uh, Greg, um, one of the things that I find so intriguing about NEA and the OECD is that uh, you, you sit there in, in France, which is obviously, uh, uh, a, a country that employs nuclear almost exclusively or certainly predominantly as an energy source and your next door neighbor is uh, Germany, which is trying to shut down their reactors. But it seems to me that over the last couple of months with uh, this invasion uh, of Ukraine by, uh, by Russia, that uh, Western Europe has certainly taken a second look at this. I think Belgium, for one, is delaying uh, closing reactors. And uh, it seems to me that the, the whole concept of energy security has gone from the back burner to the front burner. And I would like you to comment a little bit on, on your perspective of the uh, energy security issue and how it's playing out in terms of, uh, again, of public acceptance of nuclear and, and uh, both current and advanced nuclear. Yeah, th thanks very much, Peter. Uh, and congratulations to my panel uh, members for some very interesting talks. I think we had some, some common themes there. Yeah, on the, on the topic of how we see that at the NEA, I, I think you are right. There is some rethinking of uh, nuclear futures in many of the countries. And you mentioned Belgium obviously being one. Even in France, though, when you look back at it, uh, they're approximately 70, 75% right now. But if you look back to the previous uh, administration, if you remember, they were looking to cap it at 50%. And now, obviously, they've stepped back from that without a, without a, a cap on nuclear, with President Macron newly reelected, saying that they are going to support not only Flamanville, but new builds in order to at least maintain their current complements. So yeah, energy security, I think very key issue. 
due to, you know, among other factors, the, the war in the Ukraine and, and a lot of Western countries desire now in a more purposeful way to, to uh, you know, get off of R Russian uh, gas and oil and, and become a little bit more energy secure in their own domains. But also, we can't overlook the, um, uh, the, the big impact of, of the environmental movement, COP, IPCC, climate change. I think even before Ukraine, that was having a very big impact on the, uh, on the views of, of elected officials and, the, and their populace in terms of the role of nuclear in meeting these larger societal needs. I think some of my panelists talked about values and that sort of stuff. And, you know, you, you talked about the bugaboos and I think those have to be addressed, but I think societal values have pushed nuclear back onto the discussion board as a very viable means of achieving some of those climate targets. And, oh, by the way, it also provides energy security, given the fact that the supply chain for uh, the plants under construction, obviously the fuel, come from a variety of, of more, shall we say, uh, uh, dem uh, democratically um, aligned countries and that. So there's a lot to be offered, I think, and there's many uh, factors that are playing into uh, a renewed interest across the NEA member countries, with the exception of one or two, of really looking strongly at either building new, or at the very least, you mentioned Belgium, I think Switzerland's another one that's looking at extending the life, because economically, one of the other groups here at the NEA does a lot of work on the economics of nuclear, and those of you that have studied it know that a, a life extension of, a, of an existing nuclear power plant is one of the most economical means of low carbon generation for the next 20 or 30 years as well. And that factors into it. So I hope that answers your question, Peter. Thank you very yes, much. Thank you very much. John, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, you know, it's interesting because NEI has been traditionally uh, well, the proponent of generation three reactors. And a lot of people are talking about the generation four and the advanced reactors. And it's, it's really exciting um, to, to see how the, the support is, is generated for these new reactors. But what's even more intriguing, and this is the question that I'd like to ask you, is uh, we're seeing a change in public opinion, even in California, which is noted for sort of being uh, at the forefront of the environmental movement. And uh, from my understanding, Diablo Canyon services 3 million homes. And when you have blackouts in the state, it doesn't seem to make a lot of logical sense to close the reactors, yet they were about to do that. But now even governor, the governor is, is willing to take a second look, and I think many other people are willing to take a second look. So I, I'm curious, from the standpoint of NEI, how does one go and say, generate more public support or provide information to people who are interested in, again, the steady flow of electrons and preventing blackouts in, in um, advocating for the continuation of the operation of Diablo Canyon? Yeah, so, um, I, you know, I, I, I won't speak specifically to to Diablo Canyon, but I, you know, at the root of your question, I, I think is is an interesting one. Um, uh, and I'm actually going to pull on my background, right? So I spent uh, 25 years working for for multinational advertising and PR agencies, right? Reaching the entire public, every member of the public, uh, is not is just not done, right? Um, everybody um, focuses their message and their 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 goals and their metrics on on segments. Uh, reaching 300 million people is a lot of people to reach, um, uh, and requires a lot of resources. So I, I think that you, you know one of the one of the things that we've done at NEI to help um, address um, the need for having greater reach, right, um, is a, a program that we call Nuclear Matters, right? And so this is a self, you know, someone signs up, someone chooses to be a, a, a part of that conversation, that or, that group, that community, uh, it's a digital community. Um, and it's through that that we are providing information, right? Um, we provide information um, directly to people, we create forums, um, uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Dr. Katie Huff, 
was just um, part of a, a, a panel conversation that we had um, with our advocates. Um, and so I think there are, there are ways that um, we're working to do that, um, to, to reach um, the public more broadly. Uh, and a lot of that is, is providing concentric circles, right? Pulling, you know, getting the information out further and further and enlisting advocates who exist in, uh, uh, in communities across the country, right? Um, uh, to, to help carry that message forward. Um, I think that the other, uh, the other side of that is um, making sure that we are uh, creating those, those forums, those, those places that um, are taking place where community engagement can take part of. And, and, and the work that, that Greg and Ashley have, have spoken about, um, you know, those, those opportunities for more engagement with communities. Um, our utility members do it very well in the communities they operate. Right, they have very, very strong relationships with those communities. Um, they have um, all sorts of mechanisms um, uh, to engage their local communities. It's really about kind of continuing to build those circles out, um, uh, and and being that resource uh, to do that. But it, it's um, reaching all Americans is tough, uh, 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 and so I think that what you're seeing though in California. Uh, in Belgium, uh, which, which Greg, uh, Greg mentioned, um, is uh, when you stop looking at a technology-focused approach, right? I like wind. Um, uh, and really look at what the challenge is, because we have lots of evidence all over the world. When you close down a nuclear power plant, it is replaced by fossil fuels. Um, uh, we've seen that in New York, in Vermont, uh, et cetera. So um, if we're really focused on uh, addressing climate change, right, we have to take a technology neutral approach. And what the IPCC report, the most recent one said is, we have the tools, right? We have the tools available to us. We just need to use them. Um, and that's what's exciting about these next um, generation of, of reactors, um, small modular reactors, um, micro reactors, others, is they're being specifically designed to pair with wind, solar, and other carbon free sources, right? So that they can offload that power for hydrogen production or, or, or some other um, form or molten salt can store that energy for when it's needed um, so that you have a much more balanced grid, but it's all carbon free uh, and they're all working together. Okay, well, thank you. Ashley, uh, first of all, I, I just want to interject because I, uh, for the audience, but I think that uh, there are some people, and I know when I came into this uh, arena, I, I think there's a general underappreciation of what the national labs do. I think they're just such a vital component of this. And so when we're looking at advanced reactors, you have the design that's created by private industry, but how do you get a utility to want to use that? And I think the national labs play such a vital role in what I call the development before you get, you know, so you have the initial idea and you're trying to get to deployment. And I think the national labs are, are so critical and Idaho National Lab is certainly in the forefront of that. So my question is that, um, it, uh, what I would really like you to comment on is you see now in Wyoming, this project that started that was actually a Berkshire Hathaway coal mine that is now gonna end up being a TerraPower um, uh, um, advanced reactor. And Idaho National Labs has, has a great role in that. And I thought maybe you could describe to us your the role of Idaho National Labs in getting some of these advanced reactors through the development stage to deployment. Sure, absolutely, Peter. I appreciate the question. Um, you know, at, at INL and also other national labs, there's an enormous amount of important R&D and testing that goes into preparing these products for regulatory approval, as well as acceptance by potential owners and, and customers. Um, in the case of, and I also wanna say that the Department of Energy has also a very important role here. Um, if we look back to the original demonstration of reactors, it was a partnership between the Atomic Energy Commission and the private industry and, and the utility industry and others. Um, and 
we haven't had that kind of partnership for a while at the level that we have it now. We now have the advanced reactor demonstration program that commits a lot of federal support to these demonstration projects, um, such that they're 50-50 cost shares in, in the case of the natrium reactor, for example, in Wyoming, um, or approximately 50-50. So that's a big part of this, is the federal government's commitment through the bipartisan support of Congress and, and the work of multiple administrations, bipartisan, both, both parties, to move this forward. Um, so that's been vitally important. The Idaho National Lab in particular on the Natrium project plays a very important role in qualifying the fuel. Um, other things as well, but I would say the largest thing is that we have the advanced test reactor at Idaho National Laboratory, which is where the fuel for natrium will be irradiated and qualified and shown to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that it can meet their very high standards. And, and that's a crucial part of getting to a commercial product. And, and that's where INL plays the biggest role right now. I'll just also highlight digital engineering is an area where it's important to, to apply digital engineering in ways that the nuclear industry historically has not in the US, but other industries have successfully. And that can drive much more reliable construction cost and schedule outcomes. Yes, I, but I, I think that this is really critical because I think uh, it's great to talk about advanced reactors, but I think when the public is able to see one in operation, uh, I think that, that that is going to be a lot more convincing than, than reading about it. Um, I would love to go further. I don't know if I can, Don. I don't want to, to, to invade the time of my friend Larry Brown. Uh, so I think, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to conclude uh, and I, I want to thank the panelists. I'm sorry we couldn't get into more interaction, and I'm really sorry we couldn't take uh, questions from the audience. But as I said, I, I don't want to uh, invade the time of the, of the next um, the next panel. So I want to really thank you, Greg and John and Ashley. Uh, three great presentations. I really hope that the audience appreciated it, and uh, look forward to to seeing you soon down the road. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.